In the beer world, Charlie Bamporth is a legend. Charlie is the Anheuser-Busch Endowed Professor of Malting and Brewing Sciences at the University of California, Davis. For those seeking the perfect pilsner or an exceptional stout, Charlie trains those who craft the brews of our dreams. Professor Bamforth joins us to share everything we've always wanted to know about beer, but we're afraid to ask, next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Charlie, what is causing the explosion in craft brews and breweries themselves all over the place? I think people are just increasingly interested in beer, and beer is a, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, but people are realizing that it's, it's a very interesting product. There's so much diversity, and I think a lot of people who've brewed at home, and uh, they've decided uh, they'd like to have a go at making it professionally. So there's a, a tremendous amount of interest in what is, what is a fascinating product. Well, what's also fascinating is I've never heard of a professor of beer. <laughs> How does one become a professor of beer? Um, accidentally, really, I guess. Um, you know, I've been in the brewing industry for almost 40 years, and I, 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 I uh, d trained as a biochemist, so I, I studied enzymes. And uh, back in uh, 1978, uh, at a place called the Brewing Research Foundation, they wanted somebody to work on the enzymes of um, yeast and, and barley and so on uh, at a place called the Brewing Research Foundation. So I, uh, I said, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable job because, of course, being uh, uh, in a country where the legal drinking age is 18, I'd already drunk a reasonable amount of beer. And I thought, well, this is an interesting place to go. But it could have been anywhere, but it, it just happened to be studying in the, in the world of brewing. And I got the job, and uh, when you're there, they have you doing lots of other things apart from working on enzymes. So I worked on bubbles, and I worked on flavor, and so on. And, um, and then uh, a brewing company, Bass, who were the biggest paymasters of that organization, they recruited me. So I, I went into a famous brewing company, and I worked as a research manager and a quality manager. And then uh, I was also a visiting professor at a university in Scotland, Edinburgh, in uh, Harriet Watt. And so when they were looking for a professor of brewing science at UC Davis, they wanted somebody who had been in the industry, who had a strong research record and had an academic presence. So give me a job. I can check all those boxes. Well, you check all those boxes, but I, I have to ask, does uh, being English, <laughs> given the historic relationship between England and beer, give you any special insight? Um, I think it gives me insight of, of uh, great ales and so on. England, of course, historically a very famous uh, ale country. Uh, not so much lager, although more recently a lot of lagers in the UK as well. Um, but, you know, there are brewing schools elsewhere, and there are some famous brewing schools in Germany and in Belgium, for example. And so uh, I bring the, the English perspective, but also having been at uh, what became Brewing Research International, I had an insight to brewing in many different cultures and so on. And so the German brewing culture and the Czech brewing culture and the Belgian, as well as the English, um, all of those are useful things. And of course, bringing the real world experience to the students at UC Davis is very any, useful. Are there any surprising places where beer uh, is brewed or has been brewed for centuries that most people wouldn't think of? Uh, there probably aren't too many surprises. I mean, historically, the very first brew brews were actually uh, made accidentally, if you like, in what was called the Fertile Crescent, it's modern-day Iraq. So that really is where the very first brews were, were, were made back in, uh, back in the Sumerian times. Um, in terms of what people perhaps don't realize, the biggest market for beer worldwide is China. I mean, there's a lot China. more. Yeah, huge, huge amount of beer uh, in China. Of course, many, many people. Uh, and they don't drink as much as, say, an American, um, but there's so many people um, all enjoying beer that it's, it's, it overtook the United States as, as the number one beer market many years ago. In terms of consumption per capita, per, per head, then that would be the Czech Republic. They, uh, they like their beer in the Czech Republic. And, and 
Based on the nation, is there a particular affinity typically attached to a nation or, or a particular culture? Different types of beer, yes, obviously. I mean, in China, very much um, it is the, the sort of the, the, the gentle, um, the, like the, the American and North American lager style products. So, um, and of course, they, uh, they, they enjoy those. Uh, probably don't drink them quite so cold as they do uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, in the Czech Republic, again, Pilsner is the famous beer brand that comes out of the Czech Republic. It's interesting that, you know, brewers and brewing scientists like me talk about a, an off flavor in beer that makes the beer smell slightly of butterscotch. We call it diacetyl. Yet the famous beer in the Czech Republic, it, it, it hasn't got that characteristic. And yet they drink more of that than anybody else, which, which points to the, the, the point, uh, the, the, the statement, really, that what beer you like is the one you like. And what some people like is not what other people like. So, um, you know, this has got an off flavor for most people, but it's what they're looking for in that, that uh, beer in the Czech Republic. That sounds a lot more kind of small d democratic than, you know, in certain things, certain spirits, wine, where um, it's not, s uh, sometimes there's almost like a hierarchy of what you're supposed to like. Yes, and what I always say is never, never let me tell you what you should or should not like. People say to me, what is a great beer? And I say, well, what do you like? And it's you know, probably not going to be the beer that I would choose. Uh, a lot of people like sour beers. Um, I don't mind a sip of a sour beer, but I don't want a pint. Um, a lot of people like a beer in Germany with um, roast, uh, with a, a smoky malt character. I couldn't finish a pint of that, but in Bamberg, it's, it's what they want. So really, it's, um, we don't have in the world of beer people writing fancy books and making a living out of pontificating about what's right and what's wrong. You know, I almost sense a, a, a little bit of disdain for <laughs> all of that. I don't know, it's disdain. It's, it's done in a, in a hopefully a genial um, and friendly sort of way, but um, there is a degree of pomposity that can be associated with certain types of beverage. Well, you wrote a book called Grape and Grain, yeah. where you, you were covering both subject matters. What were you trying to say with that book? What I was trying to say was that, you know, so many people say to me, oh, well, wine is clearly must be harder to make, and it, mm, it's much more sophisticated, and surely it's healthier, and surely uh, it is a better thing to drink alongside food. And the reality is the opposite for all of those things. I, I don't want to decry wine, and I, I enjoy wine, and we have wine at home. Um, and occasionally I've even been seen to be drinking it in public, but, but, <laughs> but, but w wine is not harder to make than beer. Beer is a lot harder to make, and beer is a better accompaniment How so? How is it harder to make? Well, it's a much more complicated process. Uh, so basically, with wine, once you've got are grapes, and they contain a preformed sugar, so once you've crushed them, uh, and some people don't even put extra yeast in, they just take advantage of the adventitious yeast, and then allow it to ferment, and, and you know, there you are, you've got wine. But with beer, you're starting with grain, and it has to be malted, which means it has to be sprouted and then dried, um, and then extracted, and the starches have got to be broken down in a process to make the sugars. So even before you've made the sugars, there's several weeks have gone by. Um, and then, of course, you've got other ingredients as well that we worry about. We worry about the water. Uh, we worry about the hops, and of course we worry about the yeast strain. Most winemakers are not too fussy about what yeast they use, but, uh, but the brewer is very fastidious. It's a different yeast for an ale as opposed to a lager, and when it comes to ale yeast, there are lots and lots of different ale yeasts. Uh, the ale yeast used for a Hefeweizen is a very special one which gives a certain type of character, the clove and the banana character. So it's a much more complicated process, and not only that, we don't we don't hide behind the concept of vintage. Every drop is vintage. Hold on, stop there. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What I mean is that brewers are seeking to produce the same product every time, totally consistently. So let's take a, 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 a beer at random. Let's say Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, no matter when or where you are drinking Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Ken Grossman expects it to taste the same every time. Excellent every time. So oh, so what you're saying is that um, you don't get to say, well, it was a bad harvest. I think, I think if August Bush in, in, in his day would go into a brewery and they said it wasn't a good year for hops, those people would not be in a job very easily. 
every year has got to be a good year. So what you do is you adjust the process. You, you, you change things around to, to get a consistent product every time. Remembering that the, the grain and the hops, they're, they're just as much a biological entity as, as grapes. They change every year. And there's a, a regional and a geographic uh, in, uh, factor at play here. But brewers overcome that and so that they consistently deliver a product, the product that people expect. Well, when you look at your CV, there's a, a lot of technical and scientific e expertise. And I've got to ask you the classic nature or nurture uh, sort of question, which is art or science, beer brewing? Well, it's, it's primarily science, science and technology. Um, and not only that, brewing uh, work going on in breweries a century or so ago was delivering science that was being applied throughout society. So concepts of things like pH uh, and, uh, and enzymes, these came out of the brewing industry. Um, but there is an art to it as well. You know, it's the, it's the creativity, um, it's the, the beauty of the product. And what is more artistic than, than seeing a, a beer poured into a glass and seeing all the theatre that goes on when you when you're actually uh, pouring a beer and looking at the, this this visual sensation. That's a great segue for the fact that you brought a, a, a couple of things for us to try. I did, and and we all want to know, <laughs> okay, how do we taste beer and what should we be looking for? So please. Well, the first thing you have to do is is, is to pour it into a glass. I mean, a lot of people drink it straight out of the bottle, but. Uh, uh, only, only us working class kids from Detroit, <laughs> you know? I understand when there's a circumstance for doing it. I guess if you're in a boat fishing or something, I, I get it. But what I've got here, uh, Scott, are some, uh, some local beers. This first one is from, uh, is from Sudwork, which of course has been around for 30 years or so. And this is a beer that uh, is, is a triumph of, of, and, and says everything about what the craft brewing industry is all about. Um, it, it, it is a beer that is a in some ways a hybrid between a, a lager and a, a, an ale. And, and look, pour with vigor. So there you are, you can have that one. Okay. Uh, pour with vigor, pour it so that really you produce plenty of foam and admire the foam. But this is a lager, so it, it is a, 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 a Pilsner type lager. Mm -hmm. Very good health, cheers. Cheers. Um, but it's, it's got a dry hop in it, so they put hops into the finished product to give mm -hmm. it a really nice hoppy nose. Mm. So you've got really, uh, it, it's a lager in every respect, it's made with a lager yeast and uh, it's got a nice uh, gentle colour from a fairly dry, uh, lightly dried malt but they put hops in and the oils from the hops right at the end uh, of the process, they get in uh, in larger quantities into the beer and give this nice floral fruity nose. Mm. That's good. And it's pleasant bitterness as well. Yes. It's pleasant bitterness. Because hops provide bitterness, but they provide aroma. If, uh, if you make a, if, uh, the way they would do it in the Czech Republic, they would add some of those hops right at the end of the boiling stage in the brew house. And the, the aroma would be much more subtle. But by putting the hops in to the finished beer, you get a more intense character. And it's called Cascade Array because Cascade is a very mm -hmm. famous hop variety. It's one of the the first, what we call a Roma hop variety that was bred in uh, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. My. It's a good product. I wish you all were here. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really a wonderful beer. So uh, another question, um, cold, coldest, warm, <laughs> um, do different beers um, taste, or, or are they meant to be served warm, cold, and you really have to figure that out as well? Yeah, I get asked uh, that a great deal because the he people hear the English accent and they say, well, you drink beer warm, don't you? And I always say, well, if you think 55 Fahrenheit is warm, then yeah, I guess I do, uh, which of course is classic cellar temperature. So an English ale, one of these hand-pumped ales that you get um, in, in England, is best consumed at cellar temperature, about 55. If you've got a uh, a fairly gently flavoured North American lager style product, then th they're intended to be consumed straight out of the refrigerators. Um, so, uh, you know, high 30s, uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Basically, the, the more intense the flavour and the higher the alcohol content, the higher the temperature. So, 55 or perhaps even a little bit higher if you are drinking, say, a barley wine. Um, 
So, yeah, different beers, different temperatures. But in my house, all the beer is in the refrigerator because that makes it last longer. Yeah. Now, beer is, we have national brands mm -hmm. like Anheuser-Busch mm -hmm. uh, and others. And we, we tend to, you know, there, there's a tendency for people to say, oh, well, those beers, those are mass production beers and that, you know, craft beers are really where it's at. Uh, what say you on that? Well, I argue that all brewers are craftspersons. And it doesn't matter whether they're working for the biggest brewing company or the smallest. They, they're all skilled, um, hopefully properly trained brewers and, and are, are, are doing their utmost to provide the customer with what the customer wants. And let's be frank, there are, you know, there are millions of people whose beer of choice is a fairly gently flavored North American lager. Um, for many people, they're, they're looking to explore other types of products, and the so-called craft industry is what um, delivers there. It, 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 people have great difficulty in identifying what craft really means. The Brewers Association define it as a brewing company making less than six million barrels of beer every year. That sounds pretty big. Well, that's equivalent to the output of Denmark. Um, so that's a fairly, so there's some fairly big brewing companies that are, are craft brewers. Um, so I, to me, a craft brewery is, uh, if I understand what people mean by a craft brewery, it is reasonably local sometimes, but not always, because there are some national companies like Sierra Nevada that are truly, in every respect, craft brewing companies. They, they, they have all the ideals of looking after the environment, looking after the people, uh, producing products of excellence, of course, um, and, um, and, and really um, producing a diversity of products. But the big guys also make a diversity of products. And the problem is that, that some of the customers are not prepared to accept that a big company is able to make a great beer. And that's just not true. Um, it, is, it is the case that the large brewing companies have got a lot of power. And it's very difficult for smaller companies to get their beers into the marketplace. And that is a frustration. And it, I understand the difficulty. It there. does seem, though, that uh, there are a lot in the marketplace now. In fact, if you go to a, a Total Wine or a Bev's Beverages and more, yeah. there are so many yeah. beers now, yeah. you feel a little bit intimidated. <laughs> Yes, you do, um, but uh, I mean, still, the, if you look very carefully at those shelves, you find that they, you know, there's still the heaviest preponderance is are the products from the larger companies. There are, there are a lot, there are a lot. The ones that will succeed, Scott, are the ones that are consistently good. Quality is the number one driving force. Um, and there are a few too many gimmicks that are going on right now. Like what? Well, you know, wine guys, and I, I, I jokingly say we can't learn any from, from anything from them. Well, we can. We can learn about celebrating our raw materials a bit more. And there are brewers that celebrate the malt and the hops and the, the water and the yeast and so on. There's a bit too much of a tendency to want to go to extremes and put in some strange ingredients. Uh, mm. um, uh, you know, I, I remember having a chili beer not long ago up in uh, 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 Northern California, and I've never had any Indian meal remotely as hot spicy as that beer. Thoroughly undrinkable. But it was somebody trying to have a point of difference. Um, so I think, I think it's important that brewers allow their uh, products to stand on the basis of, of uh, a celebration of, of traditional materials, I think. Um, there is room for, for variation. There is room for experimentation. You know, nobody previously had done dry hopped Pilsner beers. And it works. It's like black IPAs. They work. Um, but some of the innovations um, are probably a little bit too ridiculous. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, we had J.E. Payne, yeah. uh, who uh, is one of the founders of Rustaller, yeah. on the show. And he was talking about, um, with another young man that was on here, about a particular strain of hops right. and how important that the local... Uh, ground was to growing the strain for what they were trying to produce. Is, is beer fundamentally a local product? Um, I understand where uh, Jay is coming from on that. And, and as I said earlier, your raw materials will differ depending on where you grow them. 
And the hop, you know, there's a huge number of hop varieties, just like you have a lot of grape varieties, you have a lot of hop varieties, all with different characteristics. So the, inherit the, the variety of the hop uh, has a role to play, and where it's grown has a role to play. The main reason why a product is, is, is local, they're, 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 the main one is that beer deteriorates with time. The vast majority of beers deteriorate with time. And if they travel a long way, it's not good for them. So a lot of interest in imported beers into this country. But, but by the time they've come across on an ocean, through whatever conditions have been on that ship, and by the time it gets across country and so mm. they're not fresh. They taste of cardboard and, and other undesirable things as well. So beer locally is, is best and freshest. And so you don't lay down beer like port wine and bring it out 30 years later or something? Only like if it's that. one of the more alcoholic ones. If it's an alcoholic one, say barley wine. Um, up in Chico, you can have a vertical tasting of Bigfoot barley wine and see how it's changed. What is it like now in 2017 compared to 2016, 2015 and so on. Um, and, and that um, is interesting and it may change in, in similar ways, probably because of the high alcohol content. The chemistry is somewhat similar to what it is in, in a wine. But for most beers, it isn't like that. Is, is beer more of a, com a, a, a communal type of, of product where it is that we celebrate this together uh, as opposed to sort of like enjoying uh, like a scotch or something like that by yourself somewhere? I think it is. I mean, scot uh, a scotch, I enjoy a scotch, but it's not the sort of thing you sort of, you know, have a, you know, uh, have a communal gathering around. Yeah, I'm English. I come from a society where the pub historically is very, very important. My favorite pub is, is up on the North Yorkshire Moors. And in that pub, there's no TV and there's no food really to, to speak of. There is beer and conversation. And people come off the moors and they've been walking and they have a beer and they engage in conversation. It's a great adjunct. Speaking of food, is there, are there particular foods? Does food go with beer? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm fond of saying that you think of any Asian food, it goes far better with beer. You know, you, I mean, I, I'm English, so Indian food is my favorite. And you've got to have beer with Indian food. You think of Mexican food and pizza and, and but you know, there, there are, Virtually any food stuff you can imagine, there is a beer for that. I particularly think that cheese goes superbly well. Cheese? Cheese. Che and cheese. People talk about cheese and wine part. There's nothing to compare with the cheese and the beer event. Um, something like Humboldt Fog, paired with one of the Vinicillas or sour beers from the Russian River Brewing Company. They just, oh, it's just heaven in your mouth at the time when you consume those two things together. Okay, let me do a rapid association with you. If okay. beer goes with food, okay, this is fascinating. Why? Okay, what would you pair steak with for a beer? I would uh, pair that with a fairly rich ale, pale ale, possibly an IPA, but a fairly you know, rich pale ale. Chicken? Chicken, I would probably go with Pilsner for chicken. Pasta with white sauce? Actually, that will be one where I, I think one of the, uh, the, the smoky beers out of uh, uh, the Bamberg might go quite nicely with that. Poached fish. I'm trying to stump you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the important thing to say, uh, Scott, is that it really is a personal thing. I'll tell you, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll deflect that question because I remember I did a cheese and beer pairing with a cheese expert once, and they brought out the wrong beer with the, the cheese. And of course, it, it was the best pairing of the, the whole lot, but we'd not planned that. Ah. Uh, we, of course, we, we got through it and said, well, we thought you'd like that pairing, but of course it wasn't the one that was planned. They just brought out the wrong beer. Mm -hmm. So really, at the end of the day, it's what you want. A, a really classic one, I, I, I do beer and, and, and uh, food dinners, and the later in the, the meal it goes, the better the pairing becomes. Now, there's at least two reasons why that might be, <laughs> but, um, but when you get to the desserts, uh, say a chocolate dessert, um, some of those pairings are astonishing. I remember pairing a rich chocolate cake with a barrel-aged narwhal from Sierra Nevada once, and oh, that was, I mean, people were, were speechless. They're, they're, you know, it's a conversation stopper as people savored this. It, it's amazing to hear this. This mm. opens up a whole new dimension uh, for us. Um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's never heard this before. So what do we have here? We have a stout. I think you mentioned to me that uh, you might uh, you, you enjoy a stout. Yes, so, I do. Uh, so this one is from New Helvetia. 
which of course is uh, uh, a brewing company down on Broadway in, uh, in Sacramento. Um, and um, it, is, um, it, it is a darker product, okay? So um, a stout is made with roasted grain. Mm -hmm. Of course, the most famous one of these is, uh, is Guinness uh, from yes. Ireland. Um, and what they use to make that product, uh, and I'm sure it's going into this as well, cheers, cheers. is uh, roasted barley. Mm -hmm. So what you get with this, you, you've got a, a, a strong roasted, uh, almost a burnt character. Um, maybe the malt, uh, it has been malted, but maybe heated very, very intensely to get a chocolate, uh, black malt type character. So the main malt is going to be a fairly pale malt, but you're also going to have these roasted malts in there that are going to give you that rich mocha, coffee, chocolate type character. All right. Well, Professor Bamforth, we're going to have to leave it there. We're, we may be out of time, but we've got plenty left to drink. Yes. Sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. That's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. So this At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video.